I'm gonna take that damn thing Let me answer it. Let me answer it. Maybe a man's voice will frighten him away. Hello? Hello. Will you speak up? Is he saying something? Yeah, Apollo seems to have a very limited vocabulary. Listen, will you speak up? Cliff. Cliff. Cliff! Cliff! What are you... Cliff! Your heart's beating. What's the matter with you? No, I got you where I want you. Cliff, oh, stop oh, it! Oh, oh, hey, that hurts! That hurts! Oh, that hurts! Ow! Ow! Ah. Ow! Ah. 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 Who is this? It's Owen. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just fine. Listen, I, I just wanted you to know that I talked to Eddie Vaughn and to my wife about the, uh, you know, the curse on Mansion of the Damned, and you were right. You were completely right. Well, I don't know whether to say I'm, I'm happy or, or, or sad about it, just as long as they stop. Listen, I put an end to that whole nonsense, believe me. I mean, they swore to me that they wouldn't do any more tricks for the sake of publicity. Well, glad to hear it. Yeah, listen, uh, Deborah, don't blame Nola. <laughs> no, really, she's, um, well, look, it's, it's, it's really Eddie's fault, you know, he's a showman from the old school, and I guess the old school didn't believe too much in honesty. <laughs> you know what that's like, so I guess we'll just have to depend on the quality of the film for, you know, whatever publicity we get. Listen, uh, any chance of us getting together soon? Um, I'd like to talk this over with you, you know, what they did and how they did it. Well, yeah, uh, but I don't know when I'm going to be able to be free, Owen. Owen? Well, now, you told me that you'd have dinner with me one night this week. Yeah, I will, I will, if you can get away. <laughs> hey, listen, you know what they say about wild horses. Uh, listen, um, Deborah, there's just uh, one other thing. I, I told Eddie that you were on to his, uh, you know, his little tricks, and he's very worried about it. Uh, well, as you said, if it comes out into the open, it could hurt the film. Just make sure you put a halt to it, my friend. Okay. Hey, I appreciate that. You know, appreciation isn't the only thing I feel for you. I'm sure you know that. I love you, Deborah. Uh, um, oh, and look, I've, I've got to go now. I know, I know. I guess I shouldn't have said that. Uh, for the first time, anyway, over the telephone wire. Uh, good night. Well, how's Mr. Hollywood? You heard my phone conversation. I'm gonna get dressed. Hey, hey don't, don't you want to wrestle again? No, I don't. Come on, best two out of three falls. Look, Cliff, this isn't funny. Yeah, it has to be funny, Scarlett. Now you have to have a sense of humor. Look, nobody ever got killed over the phone. Look, somebody is gonna get killed right here if you don't leave this house. Wait, wait. I know what comes next. Don't want to keep Owen baby waiting, do we? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm not seeing Owen. I'm seeing his daughter. Oh, getting to know the family. How nice. What about Mrs. Uh, Madison? Seeing her much? Look. I, uh, have only met Mrs. Madison once or twice in my whole life, Cliff. <laughs> I wonder why. Just go. I know this part, too. Oh. Sure you don't want me to stay here and answer your phone? I mean, uh, you know, if they had any breather calls, I could take a message. <sighs> I know this part, too.
glad to see you. I just talked to Deborah Saxon. I told her that it's all out in the open about those ridiculous tricks you've been playing. Oh, and there's the something sounds... else that's got to come out in the you open. just let me finish. I swore to her that there wouldn't be any more of this nonsense, that nobody else was going to be clobbered by falling chandeliers and all these crazy no, ghosts. Oh, I just talked to Brian. Why didn't you tell me what the hell had been going on in this house? About Brian and Paige. Well, what, what did he tell you? For God's sake, Owen. What did you and Nola do to those kids? I mean, were you so wrapped up in your own problems you didn't see what was happening to them? Eddie, they were our problems. Problems that Nola and I created 25 years ago. We just didn't realize that they were going to get so complicated, mm -hmm. that's all. They love each other, Owen. Oh, they don't. They can't. Eddie, look, I told Brian the truth three years ago when I realized that something was ch had changed between them. That they were no longer acting as brother and sister. Well, no wonder they weren't acting that way. You brought them together from two different families, for Pete's sake. They never thought of each other as brother and sister. We assumed that they would. I mean, don't just look. Don't just see it, Eddie. You bring two children together into, into one house, and you let them, you let them grow up together that way, and you assume that they're going to continue to think of each other that way. So you told Brian three years ago, and he walked right out of this house and into a recruiting office. Yes. That's just what he did. And he said you were glad of it. I understood it. Let's put it that way. He said you were happy about it because it gave you a perfect solution. Only you never told Paige the truth about it, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't think there was any need to. I thought she'd just get over the crush that she had on Brian. But then he came home, and realized that she was in trouble, and the whole thing just started up again. Then it wasn't a simple crush, was it? It was the real thing. Damn it. They're no longer kids. Oh, and they're, they're adults, and they have rights. Well, they don't have a right to this. My God, Eddie, what are you saying? Look, don't you think that I have hated myself for this? Don't you think that I've hated what I did to them? What's done is done, Eddie. And there's no other answer, but they have to stay away from each other. Why didn't you tell me about this? I thought I was, I was close to, to both of you. To all of this family. Because, Eddie, I felt that enough has been said about it already. Okay? Now, there's just no other answer except that it should just... They should stay away from each other. Is that so? Huh. Kids can really break your heart, can't they? Did you know that Brian was thinking of leaving again? I can't say that I am surprised. Mm. I mean, they haven't done a very good job of forgetting about it. Even though they know it's hopeless, even though they know it's not going to work. They, they still feel the same way for each other. April says she's going to meet us. She'll be here any minute. Look, I really don't like the idea of you buying this dinner. Why not? Who else have I got to spend money on? Well, Jamie, for one. Ah, uh, the kid's a cheap date. Besides, I get free babysitting, not to mention my rent. Ever since Geraldine took over, one thing I don't have to worry about is my finances, at least until the election's over. You're going to win that election by a landslide. I don't know. You see Sally Vickers' column today in the uh, Monticello Star? I don't read the Star. What's it doing in your wastebasket, then? Visiting friends? <laughs> I buy it so I can have the pleasure of throwing it away. Yeah, sure. It's the third day in a row she's chosen to run a paragraph on my marital status. <clears throat> Think it would hurt my political chances if I punched out a woman? Look, Logan, no gossip column is ever going to affect the outcome of an election. Don't count on that. My speeches haven't won me any votes, Draper, and this sort of stuff could hurt me. Listen to this. Listen, listen. Friends of D.A. Logan Swift are concerned about his reclusive behavior since his wife left bed and board. But his political supporters are even more concerned about his ability to maintain the slim lead he showed in the polls before Mrs. D.A. flew the coop. Her name's Raven, by the way. Could D.A. Swift's political future be summed up as nevermore? <laughs> it's very cute. Don't you like that? Like, throw that junk away. If you want to read something, read this, the new law journal. Uh, I don't know. I'll tell you something funny. Hmm. If I do lose this election, I don't even think I'll care. Oh, Swifty, you don't mean that. You love that job. 
Well, it gives me some place to go every day. I'll say that for You're it. You're going to be going there for a long time. Take my word for it. Well, if worse comes to worse, I can always go into private practice, right? I mean, right. you could use a little competition. Who knows? Maybe you and Mike could even knock another name on the door. Sure. Of course, if that job comes through for you in New York, you won't even have your name on the door, will you? Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. It makes me take some time. You seen that Henson yet? I don't know when I'm going to see him. No? How come? Hasn't he said he'll give you a definite date? No. Well, as a matter of fact, it's uh, more indefinite than ever. Why is that? Well, remember last time I went to New York to see him, he went uh, into the hospital. So, now this time he's in the hospital again, I have to wait till he gets out. Oh, I see. That's no gag. I mean, he called me personally to tell me. He'll see me the minute he gets out. I didn't know you talked to him. Does he sound like a nice guy? <sighs> yeah, he sounds all right. You know, I, I think his... I think his voice shook a little bit when I talked to him. <laughs> oh, you are sensitive. I, yeah, I am sensitive. I don't know. It still hurts, Swifty. It's like a wound. The job's still open, right? Yeah. Okay. All I have to do is convince him that I'm the right man for it. <laughs> Henson. It's funny, the name's ringing a bell. Well, it should. I've been talking about it for the last 20 no, minutes. No, it's a brand new bell. I think I saw something about it in here. In the laundry room? One right here. This is the one. I didn't see it. Yeah, you're too busy reading the gossip column. Oh, yeah, here we go. What? Oh, I got a picture of him. Uh, that's funny. Oh. It says here he and his wife are off on a European tour, a six week tour. Henson, senior partner of Seward Paxton Whiteside, with his wife, off on a six week tour of Europe. I don't understand that. But it's pretty clear he's going abroad. He's supposed to be going to the hospital. Well, there's hospitals over there. No. Logan, it says a tour. One hospital is not a tour. I, I don't understand this. Hello. Oh, hi, Logan. You're there she is. I get the first hug. I'm closest oh, to the door. Do. Mm. Nice to see you. Same here. Hello, husband. How are you? Hi, honey. I hope you two are starved, because I am. You know the appetite we... Pregnant women now? Mm -hmm. uh, pickles and ice cream. Ugh. Oh, I was thinking more of steak, baked potatoes, pickles and ice cream. Take it easy now. I'm buying. Oh, no go. Sorry. No what? deal. Why not? Uh, it, well, it's not fair. First of all, there are two of us and only one of you. As a matter of fact, there are about two and a half of us and only one of you. Mm. Hey, well, how do you like this? I mean, uh, this man's beautiful, attractive, pregnant wife walks in. He sits here and reads the newspaper. Shocking. I, I'm sorry, honey. There's something here that doesn't make any sense. Is it the Law Journal? Absolutely nothing in there makes sense to me. Well, here. You take a look at it. Tell me what you think. This picture. David Henson? Uh -huh. Finally get to see what he looks like. What's this about a European vacation? Yeah. It must be a mistake. Look, he probably had this European jaunt planned, and then he had to check back into the hospital later. Yeah, well, look, um, there's no point in worrying about it. What does it say? Six weeks? You can see him when he gets back, huh? What do you say? I'm starved. You two ready to go? Oh, oh I'm more than ready. Let's go. Sure. Let's go. It was really very kind of you and Mike to let me drop over on such short notice. I mean, we get together so, so seldom. Mm, well, the last time was the uh, party that you gave for the uh, movie company, yeah. wasn't it? Right. <laughs> How's it coming, by the way? I hear the production is slightly uh, oh. bewitched. <laughs> well, that's all very silly. I must say it gives me some tasty tidbits for WMON News, though. Mm. I uh, hope the publicity helps uh, Owen Madison. Mm. He's an old friend of yours, isn't he? Yes. Um, but as a matter of fact, the reason I called and asked if I could come over is to discuss another old friend, a mutual old friend, as it turns out, in the other coast, uh, in New York. I think you know of whom I speak? I think I can guess, Margo. Yes, well, I had a rather interesting conversation with David Henson on the telephone this evening, and he tells me that you two had a, a lovely dinner together. Oh, yes, he's a very interesting man. Of course, being lawyers, we had a great deal in common. Oh, yes, and uh, someone in common, Draper. It's really so unfortunate that Mr. Henson rejected uh, Draper without even um, giving him an interview. 
Margot, that was really the point of my meeting with him, to ask him why. Oh, and I suppose he told you why. Didn't let me freshen your drink for you. Ah, uh, please, thank you. Mike, do you mind, I mean, do you think maybe we could be painfully honest with one another? I hope we can be. You walked away from that meeting feeling as though I were in some way responsible for David's decision, for Draper not getting that job, didn't you? Margot, we're concerned about Draper. Not just because he's our friend. He's also Mike's partner. And Draper's work has been um, seriously affected ever since the day that that job offer was withdrawn. Now, Mr. Henson must have received some seriously negative opinions about Draper from someone he knew. And from someone Mr. Henson trusted, of course. Now, look, if we're going to be uh, painfully honest, let's be just that. Nancy and I had good reason to believe that you were involved somehow. But it, it, it wasn't out of maliciousness towards oh. Draper. It was because you wanted to keep April here I would like you. to clear the record on this little incident. Yes, David Henson asked my advice about Draper. Why shouldn't he? We're old friends. He knows that I'm, I know Draper. And I told him what I felt was the simple truth. That Draper is too immature for the job. Now, it's a job that was offered to your husband, for heaven's sake. Oh, but I don't think that matters in well, this of case, Of course Margo. it matters. Draper has nowhere near the experience, the expertise, the ability that Mike has, and you know that. But, Margot, the comparison is not valid. I was offered a partnership. Draper was offered a job. And a damned good one at that, and one that he really wanted. But I just don't understand why you felt you had to interfere in the first place. Now, why did you have to have that dinner with David Henson? Surely you, you don't want to lose Draper any more than I want to lose April. You're right, Margot. I don't want to lose Draper. I value him highly. But I feel that what happened to him was an injustice. And justice, believe it or not, is a very important part of my life, as it is to most lawyers who care about what they do for a living. Well, may I ask a very simple question? What do you intend to do about it? I mean, do you intend to tell Draper about my talking to Mr. Henson? That was never my intention. Is it your intention now? No, it's not. I see no reason to do so, especially since Mr. Henson has agreed to see Draper now. You know that, don't you? Well, yes, yes, I, I know that. I know it's only a horror movie, Deborah, but I'm just an actor in it. Why do I have to be scared Can I get you anything to death else? all the time? No, that's fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Paige, I have a feeling that things are going to be improving around the soundstage from now on. What do you mean? Well, I talked to your father a little while ago, and he said he's going to just put a stop to all this cursed nonsense. You know, all it has been is carelessness, and people blowing things out of proportion. Uh, Deborah, I'm not afraid of ghosts. I'm afraid of something very real, my stepmother. Why? What's she been doing? I'll tell you what happened yesterday. There's this key scene where Hester stabs her young cousin to death because she's seen her turn herself into a witch. So... <laughs> it sounds like this movie's gonna have an R rating. <laughs> no. No, Daddy doesn't think so. They don't restrict movies just because of violence anymore. I think they should. I would've given what happened yesterday a, an X rating. Nola tried to kill me. What? Well, she did stab me, and, and for a split second, I, I thought that I'd had it, but the dagger turned out to be one of those trick things. You know, when uh, you leave it alone, the blade stays out, but when you press the catch, the blade retracts into the hilt. Well, see what's wrong with that. Nola had n murder on her mind. Paige, I'm finding this very hard to believe. I mean, with all those people around? She could have said it was an accident. Look, why would she do such a thing? I mean, I know she doesn't like you very much, but that's no reason to kill you. Nilda isn't stable, Deborah. I've known her ever since she's come to Monticello, and it's gotten worse. Before we went out yesterday, I went up to her bedroom, and she was playing this music that we use as background in the horror film. Maybe she just wanted to get into the mood. Well, it's a dreadful mood. It's frightening. It, the music was a Gregorian chant. A Gregorian chant? Yeah. She was playing it over the phone. She, it seems she wanted someone to identify it or some such thing. Oh, my God. Paige. What? 
Somebody has been playing those kinds of things to me over my phone. What? I've been getting anonymous phone calls, dozens of them, day and night. Now, somebody has been trying to make my life miserable, and they are doing a good job of it. Paige, it's Nola. I wanted to change the scene on page 195 to a boom shot. I don't know, maybe we can insert it later. Well, I think we're gonna have to, Brian. We'll never get the wedding scene filmed if we change anything else right now. Dad, what about those extras? I hope they've arrived at least. Uh, yeah, they're in the dressing room. Yeah, but I think we may have a little more delay because Mrs. Livingston is having trouble fitting some of the ladies. <sighs> I think I'm the one that's gonna have a fit. Hey, come on. All right, all right, we'll just shoot Mom's scene with Nicholas Harriman first. Well, I'd better go and uh, prepare him, okay? Yeah. Brian, can I talk to you, please? Paige, look, I told you, we'll, uh, we'll talk after we finish shooting today, all right? I'm, I tried to get you this morning before you left, but you left the house before the crack you No, know, I had to be here early, Paige. We started camera setups at 6.30, right? It's practically 10 o'clock. We haven't shot a damn frame. About your mother. All right. What about my mother? I spoke to Deborah Saxon last night, <laughs> yeah. and she told me something so awful about Nola. Watch out, everybody. Here comes the witch. <laughs> yeah. Ready to cast my evil spell on all of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, here's where we are in the story. Now, Hester has just murdered her young cousin and buried her in a makeshift grave behind the mansion. She now returns to the altar room where she will recite the spell that will return her to her old self. Uh, are you ready, Miss Patterson? Uh, yes, we're ready, Mr. Madison. All right. <laughs> Places, please. This is a take. <coughs> Sound? See. Later, Wally. Scene 190, take one, sound 203. Action. Euphus, Metahim, Frugativi, et Apalavi, Prince of the Darkest Kingdom, take from me the ugly countenance of sin. I yield my powers back to the chambers of hell. Oh, your servant, Hester Atherton, begs the mercy of the master of Hades. Thus do I evoke myself. But there is no change. I'm not myself. Euphus, Metahim, Frugativi, et Apalavi. Master of Hades, change me, uh, return me, I, I, I yield you my powers, change me to myself. No, no, it cannot be. <laughs> 
Did you know it was bad luck to break mirrors, Esther? Something is wrong. Uh, uh, the spell hasn't worked. I haven't changed. No, you haven't changed. But why? Why? You gave me the spell that the sacred words are yours. Yes, Esther, the words are mine. The spell is mine. The power is mine. All of it mine. <laughs> my wedding takes place tomorrow morning. I must change back to myself now. Right now. I warned you of this, Esther. I told you this when you were burying that poor crimson flower in your garden. I told you you had broken a promise that you were not allowed to take a human life, and yet you did exactly that. I had to kill that girl. She knew my secret. She would have revealed everything. Ah, yes, she would have denounced you as a witch. But nobody would have believed her. <laughs> However, now, how could they not believe? Because that's what you are. If your powers can restore that mirror, they can restore me. Oh, I'm sorry, Esther. This is the face you're going to see in your mirror for the rest of your life. No. No, you mustn't do this to me. I have served you well. You served yourself, Esther. You used the weapons I gave you to destroy your enemies, and you have won. Tom Halifax will become yours tomorrow morning no. with the blessing of the holy church you will become his bride his beautiful blushing bride no no <laughs> cut with that it was terrific oh. right. that was good that was wonderful about this Hoffman case? You mean to say there isn't one lead? Nope, not one. A diamond merchant gets murdered in broad daylight and you can't even find one witness who saw it happen. If we had a witness, I would have brought him in. Look, check out the number of inquiries made by no less than 14 investigators on this case, including myself. Nobody saw a thing. Not acceptable. I want to see some results in this case, Guthrie, and I want to see a lot more action in your entire case load. Sorry if I'm not living up to your high standards. Skip that last remark. I know your record in this department, Guthrie. Nobody has a better one. Thank you. In fact, Marceau told me that you're his ace. Did you know he felt that way about you? I, I thought you said you never met the man. No, I never met him in person, but he left me a memo. Memo, hell, it was more like a book. In some ways, he was a very thorough man. Well, he still is. He's not dead, you know. No, he's not dead. And I'm sure he's not literally retiring. The commissioner told me he's considering entering politics. Really? Well, maybe the commissioner is afraid that uh, the chief, I mean, Bill Marceau, might get his job. Maybe we're going to have a mayor, Marceau. Huh. How about that? Wouldn't that be something? Why don't you sit down and relax a minute? Thank you. Something else I gathered from Marceau's memo, that you had some pretty close friends on this force. That's right, I've got a few. Two in particular, he mentioned, uh, Stoner and Saxon. Yeah, we've worked a few cases together. I hope we can continue. We make a pretty good trio. Saxon's come a long way for a rookie, hasn't she? And a female rookie at that. She's earned her rank. I'm sure you've seen her records. You don't think Marceau might have Bent over backwards just a little, help her out. She was the first female detective on this force, and that must have been politically important, I'm I sure. I don't think Bill Marceau did anything for political importance. Don't kid yourself, detective. This job is half politics. It's just that if you do it right, the other half doesn't realize it. Yeah, well, I still think that Deborah Saxon earned her own rank. I think she's a very good cop. She's a very effective detective, if you ask me. You, by any chance, don't have anything against female cops, do you? I wouldn't admit that if I did. These days, that's like sticking your nose in a meat grinder. That's right. But do you? You just show me the lady detectives who can handle a riot, take a knife away from a 300-pound drunk, and then go push an illegally parked car out into the street. Show me these lady cops. Yeah, well, police work isn't all muscle. That's why we have detectives, to use their heads. It's a very pretty head, too. I noticed that. 
Yes? Yes, all right, send them in. You're gonna have to excuse me, Detective. I unfortunately promised to grant an interview to the press. Yeah. It's a TV interview. If you'd like, you can stay and watch. Oh, all right. Hello. Oh, Steve. Nicole. Hi. How are you? Just, mm, just fine. Uh, let me introduce you to our new chief. This is Nicole Drake. Uh, Hi. Chief Derek Boy. Mallory. Nicole is from WMON. Nice to meet Another you. Another lady professional. <laughs> I know you've only been here a few days, but what impressions have you formed of the Monticello Police Department? Well, pretty much the same impression I had when I read a detailed account of its history back in Denver. For a town this size, I don't believe that there's a finer police force in the country. Mm, but you're aware of the fact that there has been some criticism about the department in recent years? Yes, and that doesn't surprise me. The same thing is happening to PDs all across America. It usually boils down to a matter of economics, like so many things. Ah, so you intend to fight for more money for the department. Right now, I want to see how I can fight crime effectively with the men and equipment I have. Hmm. After that, we'll see. Well, I guess you've uh, heard that your predecessor, Chief Marceau, was an active campaigner for more police recognition and support. Yes, that's one of many things I heard about Chief Marceau. Ah, then I guess you know that he was very, very popular, not just with his police department, but with most of the citizens of Monticello. Well, in my opinion, Chief Marceau was one of the finest law enforcement officials in the country. It's going to be very difficult to sit behind his desk. Well, then you realize that his shoes are going to be hard to fill. Very much so. However, he's a man who obviously earned his right to retire after serving his community so hard for so many years. Huh. Well, what do you see ahead for you, Chief Mallory? I just want to try to live up to the standards he set, Miss Drake. I don't believe I could do much better. I don't know. I don't see why everything has to change. Why can't something stay the same? It's a very heavy question for so early in the morning. Well, I can't help the hour. You know, you are not the only person that has to work, Doctor. I have to work, too. Am I keeping you from any patients? No, uh, first one's at 10 o'clock. That doesn't mean I can have a long philosophical discussion. Well, it's not philosophical? Not really. I mean, it's something specific. Yes. Okay, what's changed now? Okay, you know that uh, job that Draper was offered with that law firm, Seward, Paxton, and Whiteside? The one in New York? Yes. That's come up again? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I had thought it was all behind me. All right. Tell me what happened. Okay, look, you know how Draper agonized over losing that job, especially because he had come so close to getting it. Well, it was just one negative vote, right? Yeah. David Henson, a senior partner, and he happened to be in the hospital when we went to New York. So he flatly refused to see Draper. Anyway, that's all in the past. What has happened recently is that Mike Carr went to New York and did see Henson and convinced him to change his mind about Draper. Well, that's terrific. What's, oh, it's not terrific. Well, look, he didn't... He didn't change his mind that he was going to give Draper the job, although the job is still open. He just changed his mind in that he agreed to see Draper. Well, to see him is to love him. We all know that. When does this happen? Well, that's the other problem. That appears that it won't be for at least six weeks. Now, the twist to this whole story is that Draper and I don't know if David Henson is in the hospital or if he's on a tour in Europe. Draper has spoken to Henson. He called the house the other day to apologize to Draper for not having the meeting immediately. He said it was because he had to go into the hospital for further tests. Well, what's the problem? Why do, you, why do you doubt the guy? Because of this. Something in a recent law journal. Henson and his wife going abroad. Yeah, I don't understand it. Does it make any sense to you? Well, no, but there's a way to find out. Carol, give me Seward, Paxton, and Whiteside in New York City. It's a law firm. Miles, this is a long-distance call. Oh, I consider it therapeutic. Be my guest. Well, sorry I didn't think of this myself. Well, at least we'll know the truth. And uh, maybe we're not even worrying about anything at all. Hello? Oh, yes, may I speak? Uh, may I speak to uh, David Henson, please? Oh, I see. Um, 
Well, when do you expect him back? That long. Uh, well, is there any way I can reach him? I see. No, uh, no, there's no message. Thank you very much. Bye. Um, she said he's traveling. Doesn't know his itinerary. But that she doesn't expect him back for at least six weeks. All right, everybody, let's take our places for the wedding scene, please. Chris, you are right here, and Mr. Macefield. Your place was right here. All right, let's have it quiet on the set, please. This is a take. Roll sound. Speed. Camera. Speed. Slate it, Wall. Scene 198, take one, sound 211. And action. What a terrible pity. Patience is not among the bridesmaids. No one regrets that more than I, Mr. Williams. Such a lovely creature, and so frail. Frail in both body and mind, unfortunately. I still find it hard to believe that the girl was mad. Ah, the strains of her life were too great for her to bear. Losing her father, her mother, her baby brother, and finding herself alone in the world. Is there no chance that she might yet recover? Oh. Hester tells me that the physicians at the asylum give her no hope at all. She must spend the rest of her life in that damnable darkness. I know that you cared for her, Tom. Yes, I cared. But today is your wedding day, and you should look forward to the happy future ahead. Yes, my happy future. Mr. Whalen, we're ready to begin. Oh, yes, yes, sir. I'm presenting the bride. A great moment for you, Mr. Halfax. Yes. Your bride may not be as lovely as her cousin, but she is nonetheless a very handsome woman, you don't think so? Yes. I'm looking forward to seeing you kiss the bride. We are gathered together to join this man and this woman in lawful matrimony, which is an honorable estate, and one which should be entered into only upon mature consideration and thought, and then reverently having in mind the holy nature of the bond to be assumed. I require and charge you both that if either of you knows of any impediment why you should not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, you now confess it. Tom Halifax, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? to live together in the ordinances and holy estate of matrimony. Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep only unto her so long as you both shall live? I will. Hester Atherton, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, to live together in the ordinances and holy estate of matrimony? Will you love him and comfort him and honor and keep him in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep only unto him, so long as you both shall live? I will. Repeat after me. I, Tom, I, Tom, take thee, Hester, take thee, Hester, to be my wedded wife, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold, to have and to hold, from this day forward, from this day forward, for better or for worse, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, for richer or for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. And I pledge you my troth. And I pledge you my troth. I, Hester. I, Hester. Take thee, Tom. Take thee, Tom. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better or for worse. 
For better or for worse. For richer or poorer. For richer or poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. And I pledge you my troth. And I pledge you my troth. Inasmuch as Tom and Hester have now joined together in lawful wedlock and have witnessed the same before this company, and thereto have been given and pledged their troth, each to each other, I, in accordance with the authority vested in me by the laws of this state, pronounce that they are man and wife. You may kiss the bride. Uh, no, no, not here. I, I don't want to be kissed here. Aunt Hester, Aunt Hester! You forgot the flowers. Oh, oh my God! Oh, my God! How did you think that scene worked, Eddie? I thought it I thought it worked rather well. No, it worked fine. I think it's gonna be a terrific scene. Well, I've had my doubts about it, but once it got rolling, I think it really went beautifully. And wasn't Brian wonderful? My son is a director, Eddie. He really is. Yes, Brian has a great future ahead of him. Who knows, maybe it'll be enough to make him happy. But I doubt it. What do you mean? No, well, I know why Brian's been moping around the house so much lately. I wasn't quite sure why he always seemed so damn depressed, but now I know. Oh, Brian is still trying to find himself. That's the way young people are. I wouldn't know about that. I've never been young. Look, Eddie, we can talk about Brian some other time. Right now, I'm really completely worn out. No, I want to talk about him now. I want to talk about Brian and about Paige. <sighs> what about them? Well, I finally figured out what's going on in that house of yours. I'm sorry I didn't figure it out sooner, but now that I know, it's making me sick. You know what, exactly? About how much those kids feel about each other. Who told you? Where did you hear this nonsense? It's not nonsense, Nola. It's love. Those kids are in love with each other, and it's eating them up alive. You talk about hell, those kids are living in it. That's ridiculous. It was just a, a, a childish crush, Eddie. Nothing more than that. They'll get over it, I promise you. They have to get over it. Sure, they have to get over it. They can never be happy because they're brother and sister, which means that they're going to spend the rest of their lives just trying to forget. Eddie, please. For God's sake, Nola, how could you have let this happen? How could you? You love Brian, I know you do. Of course I love Brian, but that doesn't mean that I have to take on all of his It means that you could have I told can... him the truth. You could have saved him all this suffering. My God, Nola, don't you remember? Brian isn't Owen's child, he's my son. I finally figured out what's been going on in that house of yours. I'm sorry it took me so long to catch on, but now I know. And it's making me sick. You know what exactly? I know how those kids feel about each other. Who told you? Where did you hear this nonsense? It's not nonsense, Nola. It's love. Those kids love each other, and it's eating them up alive. Hell, you, you talk about hell. Those kids are living in it. That's ridiculous. It was just a childish crush, Eddie. Nothing more than that. They'll get over it, I promise you. They have to get over it. Sure. They'll have to get over it. They can never be happy because they're brother and sister. And that means they'll spend the rest of their lives trying to forget. Eddie, please. For God's sake, Nola, how could you have let this happen? How could you? You love Brian. I, I know you do. Of course I love Brian, but that doesn't mean that it I... It means I, that you could, have, you could have explained it to him. You could have told him the truth. You could have saved him from all this suffering. My God, Nola, have you forgotten? Brian isn't Owen's child. He's my son. Eddie Vaughn, don't you ever say that aloud again, do you hear me? You swore to me that you would never mention that again. 
That was then, Nola. That was 25 years ago. And it's just as important to me as it was then. No, it's more important now. My marriage is in enough trouble as it is. Are you trying to end it completely? Is that what you want to do? No, of, of course because not. Because that's exactly what you'll do if Owen learns the truth. He'll walk out on me, and my life will be over. Well, what about the lives of, of Brian and Paige? Eddie, for those same 25 years, you kept telling me how much you love me. Then don't do this to me. You've got to swear to me all over again that you'll not, not say one word. Nola, don't you see how I feel? You and Owen and those two kids, you're the only family I've ever had. Hell, I was just a carny bum when I met Owen. He gave me my first real break. And then I met you. Oh, what a mix-up. Eddie, there's no way you can change what we did. I was never happy with what we did. You know that. You agreed to it, Eddie. You knew it was right. No, it was wrong. Lying to Owen, letting him believe that he was the father of your child? But it was right then, wasn't it? You didn't want to hurt Owen. He knew nothing about us. Nola, don't give me that. You know perfectly well why you wanted me to keep my mouth shut. You wanted to marry Owen. And you knew that was the only way you'd get him. And you got him, too. It took a few years, but you got him. And where did that leave me? With a job, Eddie. A very good job. And with a family, too. We are your family, Eddie, in every way that matters. But... Brian is my real family, my son. You know, it's funny, Nola, but, well, I guess Brian doesn't really know me very well, and I guess I don't know him very well either, but well, I always think of him as, as my son. I feel for that kid, and I've never felt as bad for him as when he came to me and told me himself that he was in love with his own sister. She is his sister. They were raised that way, Eddie. Isn't that just as important? No. What's important is that they love each other, damn it, and they have a right to that love. Don't you see? That's what's so unfair. They're, they're suffering for our lies. Well, do you want to see me suffer? No, no, you know I don't. Do you want to see my life ended? Oh, Eddie, they're only children. They have all those years ahead of them. They have all those possibilities for the future. What do I have? You have plenty of your own years, no? I'd have nothing without my marriage. I'd be nothing without it. I'm an alcoholic, Eddie, you know that. You've got that licked. You haven't had a drink in weeks. And why? Where do you think I found this strength? Because of this movie? No, Eddie, it's because of Owen because I realized I was about to lose him. He knows about your problem, honey. He's lived with it. <laughs> he tried to escape from me, Eddie. Why do you think he left California? It wasn't to get Paige away from all that notoriety, and it wasn't because he thought his own career was over. It was to get away from me. No, I still think he cares for you. Oh, God, Eddie. There's only one reason I've kept my husband, because there's been nobody else. Nobody else he's really cared about. Now there is. Oh, I don't think that's serious. No, look, these things just happen, you know. He's in love with Deborah Saxon, and all he needs is some reason to leave me for her. Something that can justify it in his own mind. And you give him that excuse, Eddie. If Owen ever learned the truth about Brian, if he learned that I've tricked him for 25 years... But damn it, the joke is on Brian now, don't you see? It's on Brian and Paige. We can't let them pay for, for something that we've done. Uh, Mom, we're all set up uh, for the next scene. You, uh, you feel up to it? Oh, look, the, the truth is, Brian, I'm, I'm absolutely exhausted. Do you, do you suppose we could do it in the morning, huh? Yeah. I guess you have to be prepared for that. Well, uh, people saying that the only reason you got this part was because your father produced the movie. Well, I am expecting it, but um, you know what I'm going to tell them? What? But they're absolutely right. I can't deny it. I was in the right place at the right time. 
My father's house. <laughs> well, I think when they see your performance, it won't matter. I think you're darn good. Well, I'll be happy if uh, the movie's a success in spite of my efforts. Uh, this movie must mean a lot to you. To all of us, it's a, a family adventure. That's right, your whole family's involved. Yeah. Or is it? I mean, uh, are there any more at home like you? No. Four Madisons, count them, four. Uh, how about uh, close friends, like boyfriends? No, no, there's, there's nobody in my life like that. You must have heard how complicated my life has been this past year. How could I help it? It was impossible to pick up the paper without reading the name Paige Madison. I remember thinking it. What? Well, that you were an awfully pretty girl to be a gunrunner. The truth is, Chris, I was an awfully stupid girl. If, if you'll excuse me, I have to go talk to my brother. Sure. Brian, can I talk to you, please, now? Excuse me. Uh, yeah, everybody, uh, that's a wrap. I'll see you in the morning. I thought you were a little uh, occupied talking to our handsome leading man. Oh, Brian, please, this is serious. All right, Paige, before you, uh, you said you wanted to talk about Mom, right? Yeah, oh, it's, something, it's something awful, Brian, but I'm, I'm afraid to tell it to you. I'm afraid that'll make you dislike me more than you already do. Hey, don't ever say that, Paige. I could never dislike you. All right, now... What is it? What's she done to you this time? Well, she hasn't done anything to me, but she has been tormenting Deborah. She what? It's true. All right. Uh, just what does tormenting mean? Well, well she, she's been playing these tricks on her, making her life miserable. And I know that sounds crazy and, and childish and just plain mean, but it's what she's been doing. What? She's been phoning her at all hours. All right, now, wait a minute, Paige. Now, just wait. Now, that's a damn serious accusation you're making. I hope you're sure of what you're saying. Well, she hasn't identified herself over the phone, Brian. I don't mean that, but uh, all the phones have calls have been anonymous. But I did realize something. Look, Paige, other... Deborah Saxon is a cop. She meets criminals every day of her life. Now, how can you be sure it's Mom? Whoever is calling Deborah is playing this music over the phone. The same eerie, gothic-type music we use as background for Mansion of the Damned. That's still no proof it's Mom. Brian, will you listen to me? I saw Nola playing that music in her bedroom, holding the telephone receiver over the speaker. You saw? Oh, my God. I don't believe it. Well, I didn't want to either. It's awful. I guess I do. <laughs> you go home, Maddie? Yeah. Guess I'm not much use around here. I I'll meet you there later, okay? Yeah, maybe we can talk a little more tonight. Yes, Eddie, we can talk. We can discuss the movie business. We can talk about our old friends in L.A. We can discuss anything you like except one topic. Do you understand? Oh, darling, don't look so unhappy. Things have to be this way. Why do they have to? Because they do. There's some things in life that are just inevitable. You fall off a high place, you've got no choice but to keep falling. Until you crash, huh? There isn't going to be any crash. As for Brian and Paige, you, you wait and see. They'll both go get over this in no time. They'll both meet someone else. Doesn't it happen to people all the time? Yes, it happened to you, I guess. That's right. It happened to me. I met my first husband, and then I met Owen. Seems to me I came in there someplace. Dear Eddie, I'll always have a very special place in my heart for you. Now, let's just keep one thing in mind. The, the most important goal we have right now is this picture. Getting it finished, making it successful. Uh, I'm not even sure about the picture anymore. We got such a great start on the publicity. We, uh, we could really have gone someplace with that, with that curse angle, and now the whole thing is called quits. I don't know. By the time this picture is released, <laughs> everybody will have forgotten it ever existed. Uh, not if we have that one final curse, Eddie. 
I told you. No, no. That's too ambitious even for me. To burn down a whole studio just as a publicity stunt. But they used to burn witches, Eddie. What could be more appropriate? We could get someone to claim he saw Hester's ghost amid the fiery, fiery flames. Oh, burn, witch, burn. <laughs> I realize you don't really know Chief Mallory. Uh, it's, it's just that I was wondering how it feels to have a new chief of police at all. Well, to tell you the truth, Nancy, I'm not very happy about it. I just like Bill Marceau so much. It's funny. I don't think he was ever really comfortable with the idea of having women on the police force. I mean, how could he be after 30 years with an all-male detective squad? Well, he was the one who promoted you. Yeah, that's all the more reason he deserves credit. He was able to overcome his bias. <laughs> now, you take Derek Mallory. He's modern, college trained. He got an M.A. in criminology. And I'll bet you I have more trouble with him than I ever did with Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I shouldn't say that. I ought to give the guy a chance. Oh, yes, of course. Deborah, you're not upset about this change, are you? Well, you know how it is. Nobody likes change. And uncertainty? It's just that Bill was such a... He was an anchor, you know? He was somebody you could always depend on. And I guess right now I need an anchor. Because of your personal situation? Yeah. Oh, I have to tell you, it's not getting any better. It's, uh... I haven't seen Owen very much lately. He's working on a movie, but something else is happening. What? Well, his wife knows about us. Well, you were kind of expecting that, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. And, well, actually, I do prefer that to secrecy. But it's what she's doing about it that worries me. And the worst thing is, I don't know what she's going to do next. Well, surely you don't believe that Nola Madison broke into your apartment and did all that damage. I don't have any proof, but it's not impossible. I mean, I have a landlord who has taken up the bad habit of using his own key to get into my apartment to do various things. And the thing is, he doesn't lock the door when he leaves. Oh, really? Well, I would have a talk with that man if I were you. Yeah, I already have. Well, now, wait, you thought that it was that young man uh, who broke into the... You know, the, the one that you arrested the last time we had dinner together. Oh, yeah, yeah, Benny Hayes. Bad news, Benny? Yeah. Yeah, he certainly isn't any friend of mine. But then neither is Nola Madison. And I am sure that she's the one who's been making these phone calls. Well, Deborah, you know, there are ways to trace those calls. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go through all that trouble with the phone company, though. See, Nancy, I'm afraid to. Afraid of what? Oh, yeah, you don't want to make it common knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it could become that. I mean, she's a very famous lady. Hey, did you see that article about her in Everybody magazine about the movie? Oh, yes, The Curse of Mansion of the Damned. Yes, and I'm sure they're delighted with all that publicity. I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, some of those spooky goings on were the result of the press agent. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. Mm -hmm. So, now that you uh, feel that uh, Nolan Madison is behind everything, what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. You could tell Owen. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I could do that. Maybe I ought to get this out in the open. I mean, if she knows that I know, maybe she'll stop. Mike? Mike, is that you? Yes, Avery. Still at it, huh? Well, you know what April calls me, the old workaholic. Maybe you ought to join Workaholics Anonymous, if there is such a thing. <laughs> You've been keeping some pretty late hours yourself. How's it going in court? 
Kind of grueling. My opposing attorney turns out to be a jack-in-the-box. Objected to every single question I asked. Ouch. At one point, he even objected because I asked the witness to repeat his name. But despite his shenanigans, I think the verdict will go my way tomorrow. I sure hope so. Well, I've got some dictation to do, then I'm going to call it a day. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Did you read yesterday's law journal? In my uh, usual hurried fashion. Then I it? assume you skipped over the personal news call? Well, the truth is, I seldom read that column. The prospect of attorneys getting uh, married, divorced, uh, giving birth is not too exciting to me. Well, would you do me a favor? Would you take a look at this and tell me what you think? Sure. You recognize him? Sure, it's David Henson. I thought you said he was going into the hospital. Well, he didn't. Apparently, he changed his mind. Instead, he's spending six weeks in Europe. Well, April said that I waited this long for the interview. I can certainly wait till the end of the year. But then again, that takes us up into the holiday season. You know how busy everybody is then. Draper, I thought Henson was sincere when he said he'd see you. Was that's the question in your mind. Was he sincere, Mike? Well, maybe I shouldn't say that, since you are such a good judge of character. Well, I'm not a human lie detector, but I did think he meant it. Maybe he was just trying to please you, and he had no intention of following through. Then again, Mike, I could be looking on the dark side of things, couldn't I? Are you sure this story is accurate? Miles called Seward Pax, and they concurred. Henson's going to be traveling for the next six weeks. Well, just because a man is on a different continent doesn't mean that he's out of touch. Look, I'll get in touch with him myself. Uh, no, no, you don't have to do that, Mike. I'll just wait and see what happens. If that's what you want. I'm just trying to figure out why the man is going to such pains to avoid me. A man he's never even met. Mrs. Madison, please don't do this to me. Mrs. Madison, I know you're the one who's been calling me. I know you've been playing that strange music and saying what you've been saying to me. Now, I know you probably think that I'm some sort of a monster or something. You probably hate me because... Well, you know, because of... The, maybe you think in some way I'm trying to hurt you, but I'm not. I, I swear I'm not. Now, it's true that I've been seeing your husband. Uh, we've had dinner together more than once, but that's all. And as for Paige, you're wrong if you think she's encouraging anything between Owen and me. She's not, believe me. She has had nothing to do with whatever has been happening. Look, she's my friend. And she, she and I were friends even before Owen and I knew each other. Would you please say something to me, Mrs. Madison? Would you talk to me? Look, maybe if we get together in person, we can talk to each other. How do you feel about that? Uh, maybe we can get Mrs. Madison?
frustrated days pass without sight the edge of night half dark half light as we watch our hearts Trying to hold the tenderness 